Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Aduro Clean Technologies 2023 year-end shareholder update. My name is Abe Dyke. I lead the corporate development and investor relations activities here at Aduro. I'm joined today by Ofer Vikas, our CEO, Mina Bache, our CFO, and Eric Appleman, our new Chief Revenue Officer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that today's presentation is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to sell or a solicitation to buy any securities. As we discuss the future, we will be making forward-looking statements which are based on current expectations, projections, and assumptions. These statements are not guarantees of future performance and are subject to risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied today. With these considerations in mind, Let's proceed with today's update where we will share our excitement on the progress we've made in 23 and the plans we have in 2024. Thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll pass it on to you, Ulfer. Thank you, Abe. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, this is a, a very exciting moment for us to share with you our achievement for the 2023 and share with you a little bit of our insight going forward towards uh, and our plan towards our 2024. Um, I'd like to just take a moment and say that at the beginning of our 2023, we have uh, come with, uh, uh, we stated about two major milestones. The first one was that uh, we want to bring a brand, additional brands into uh, working with us uh, beyond the already existing one that we've won at the early of 2023. And the second one that it was that we will uh, push and forward, push and work forward uh, our work on the Tone Per Day uh, processing unit, uh, the R3 reactor. Of course, I'm happy to report that today we achieved both of them. Uh, we have just announced the second, uh, the adding of two more majors that adding to us, and uh, we continue the work on the R3. But with that, we'd like to share with you some information, and let me share with you some of the pictures um, that we have uh, to call it to uh, maybe intensify or show you, visualize what what is the work that we've been doing. Uh, I'll say that uh, in, during 2023, we have had, we have needed uh, basically the work, um, we needed to do the work to build the building blocks. And the building blocks, in order to achieve our milestones, were basically run R2, uh, continuous flow unit, and um, furthermore, uh, be able to increase our, our team and uh, build our operation team. So that's what we've been focusing on. That was key important for us in order to achieve uh, our milestones. And what you see here, of course, is our work and team in the lab, both in Sanya and in Toolright. Mm -hmm. The uh, work that has been done on the R2 that is now operating is dedicated for two uh, purposes. The first one is, uh, of course, generating data towards the R3. We're doing it day in and day out. And the second one is to be able to speak to our customers and on our customer engagement program and tell them, yes, we have a continuous flow unit. It is working and we're generating data. Come and see us. This is vital, vitally important because uh, the players that we're working wants to see uh, that uh, the chemistry that we're doing are running in the continuous flow. They want to know that we can visualize it in a commercial way. Um, we also have been doing tremendous amount of work on the bitumen. Uh, you, you see pictures of our bitumen unit and the flash RAM. Those are coming together. Uh, today, I'm happy to report that we are running some hydrocarbons of the bitumen mar on the bitumen unit, and the work on the flash RAM is continue. And we will have some updates going forward, but it doesn't stop us from the market uh, from doing our project. We have today two projects that we're working on. Um, we have uh, expanded our work and basically uh, initiate a big project to expand our lab. Initially, we had a, a small lab in sunny Ontario, if you remember, during 2023, we uh, uh, increased our space and we went to a journey to expand our lab. We basically took a 4,000 square feet uh, of a warehouse in London. We turned it into a state-of-the-art lab. Uh, took us about a year to do it and offices and what you see here is the space ready uh, and I'm happy to report that uh, our research team has just uh, joined in. We are working on our occupancy and the 
uh, our research team is just uh, is now starting the relocation and moving into this this lab. Uh, we also build a state of the art uh, offices for us. There is a virtual system there that help us to work virtually from uh, basically from any place of the world, as many of us are working uh, from different territories. Uh, the office has uh, has about a, a, you know a space for about twelve employees, and we can increase it if we want. Through that uh, work and achievement that we've been doing in 2023, uh, we also uh, basically had to work and increase our team. And we spent a lot of time uh, building the Aduro uh, human assets, if you will. And so on the research side, we increased our team. We built about five uh, research guys and another two that are junior management. We basically brought in on May 8 a complete sets of department, our new operation team. And they hit the ground running. We had the the unit, and we showed them come in, welcome, and go and uh, do some training, and then uh, start generating data that is related to our uh, customer engagement. And they did that actually successfully, and help us uh, move on and achieve the milestones that we've been uh, we've been doing. And of course, um, we increase uh, our management with the coming of. Stephanie, that was in charge on the branding and the marketing, a lot of the project that is, I'll show you there, um, has been led by Stephanie. Um, the uh, onboarding of our ch new chief revenue officer, Eric, and the recruitment of uh, our strong uh, member, Bob, the new member, recruiting of our strong board member, um, Marie. But maybe it's a good opportunity for Eric to say a word about you. Would you like to present yourself, Eric? Uh, yes, thank you, Ofer. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Eric Hattelman. I'm from the Netherlands, and that's also where I'm speaking from at this moment. Uh, and as to underline the very diverse and multinational character that we are as a company, but hey, we are addressing a global problem, so you need global forces for that. Uh, I bring with me uh, 35 years in the chemical industry. I'm a chemical engineer by training, and this is, of course, for me being like in the candy shop uh, to develop a completely new process for a highly relevant uh, topic. Uh, I started out in Unilever as a real engineer, became progressively more involved with commercial tasks, uh, did sales, did many customer facing activities and commercial activities. And from my first uh, CEO, I always learned like you really have to think from the customer backward and you have to think benefits for the customer rather than features of yourself. And that is what we can do here. Worked in Unilever, as I said, into their uh, chemicals branch when it was still there. Then ICI for a while became uh, my first general management role into the second largest paint company in Europe, Sigma Coatings, which is now a part of PPG, where I was in charge of all the technology for the marine and protective business. Highly exciting place, by the way. And then I was called to become an executive vice president at Swedish company Perstork. That's a one and a half billion uh, specialty chemicals house. And I was in charge of marketing, uh, innovation and corporate strategy there. That took me eight years. Came back and then there was a very interesting period where I worked as a director at the Brightlands Camelot campus. I'm sure that most of you haven't heard of that, but it is a physical location where we were bringing together all sorts of companies working on the future of the chemical industry and needless to say there's a lot about recycling and there's a lot about sustainability there we had like 20 corporates but more importantly we had 50 startups there who were doing all sorts of exciting things and one of them was aduro and when they joined us about two years ago at first, we didn't quite understand what we were doing, and then we did some questioning, and then I said, okay, well, if that is what you are doing, you are doing something absolutely fabulous and outstanding. I've never seen it. So I gave them two years to fail, and they failed to fail, and then the rest is history. I decided to join, and that's why I'm here and have the honor to speak to you today. Thank you, Eric. And uh, the journey of uh, maybe commercialization involved adding value, really sign every, adding significant value to uh, the company. And as you can see, uh, folks, uh, we are doing as much as we can to um, add, uh, build up our building blocks on one hand, but also uh, make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row to uh, move forward and, and focus on the things that are important to the company. 
On the way, of course, we have done some more uh, items. We uh, raised capital on, on April. Uh, we turned and changed the OTC to a QX. We, of course, opened an entity and uh, in Europe, where we open our face to the European market, but also uh, manage this is basically give us an opening both to grants and employees. Uh, and we have some relationship relationship build up there. Uh, we've done some major conferences that are very, very important to the company from many aspects, some of them from an investment perspective, but some of them from, from the professional. And with the help of Stephanie, uh, we have done a significant media outreach. You are familiar with the advancement uh, uh, project that we come across and we've been built up. Also, um, there is another project similar to that that we will announce in the coming uh, months. And I think it will be up and running somewhere sometimes in February in the same concept. We build uh, all of our brand and website. We update it all as well as build a new video on our process, which we'll be happy to share with you guys. For the one that stays after the Q&A, we'll be very happy to share with you this new video. Later, it will be also on our website uh, for anyone to come and see. So as you can see, a lot of things that the company has been doing uh, through 2023. Um, this is a, a great uh, point to turn and to speak a little bit about our customer engagement program and why uh, we decided to move with it the way we we do. Uh, for us, the customer engagement program has a twofold basic uh, or twofold jobs. Uh, on the front, we feel that if uh, you guys will see where we are, and I'll explain a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about the customer engagement program, um, every time we do an announcement, you'll be able to see and, and judge by yourself of where we are in this technology commercialization journey. Uh, on the other hand, internally in the company, it is encompass significant uh, work that we need to do that is related to the two of the components that I just mentioned. First of all, uh, working with customers, engaging with real life information, making sure that uh, we're not diving into uh, uh, some developing of uh, some unit and waking up after five years without real life data is significantly important to speak with these customers. Also, we're a small company and they help us to do uh, other things such as an engineering. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, benefit for us to work with the customers. Uh, we on the way, of course, also generating some revenue and this is always nice to have. Um, that journey, uh, of course, as you move forward is de-risking the whole process. Uh, on the other hand, um, when we talk about uh, the technology evaluation, collaboration and commercialization, what we see is that we build uh, a list of customers, a trend of customers that are uh, entering to test our technology. And at some point of time, uh, some of them, maybe they're paying, I don't know, anywhere between 50,000 to 200 or 300,000 per, per project. This is just a technology evaluation. And we talked about the fact that they have an interest to test the technology. Our intention in 2024 is to turn some of those uh, evaluators into collaboration, where we intend to turn 100, $200,000 to half a million to a million, $2 million of uh, projects over the years, which uh, we will partner with a, with an organization that will collaborate with us to continue and develop uh, the technology and commercialize it. So uh, the added value is not just by us getting revenue, but also uh, by us coll collaborating with someone that can help us, of course, commercialize the unit and the up, you know, down the road, do a full commercialization. In terms of uh, the level of where we want to be uh, in terms of the different uh, different systems that we are envisioning, if you look, folks, uh, for the blue colors, so those are the big uh, organization. Of course, they offer a more uh, substantial, uh, complex system. Below it, there is a lower, uh, smaller size organization, and they offer maybe a mid-range size of a system. So imagine uh, a material that is just out of, uh, of some kind of a factory. It's very, very clean, but it could be uh, complex. And uh, as for the lower one, this represents a very, very simple system, a very, very simple stream. And we think we can commercialize it first. And so we have a list of engagement on the left that you see from all front of those 
of those, uh, um, I guess, uh, options. And we envision that we will start simple to complex. So we will start with commercializing simple unit and then we'll tend, of course, to the more complex unit and then we'll move on. So again, this is a tool for you guys on one hand to judge how we're doing and where we're doing, but it's a tool for us to help us to move forward um, and, and do the commercialization in a manner that is de-risking the whole process. With that, perhaps I'll let Eric uh, talk a little bit about um our engagement and before that i'll say that in 2021 uh, sorry 2022 we end up with uh, the end of 2022 with the shell game changer we told our investors that we are intend to increase this brand and on october 2023 we reached out and said that we have two majors that join us and of course in november we also said that one of them is uh, very happy that is in they increased the project um, we also had one project on Bitumen, and now we have two to a total of five active projects that are related to the customer engagement. Um, perhaps, Eric, I'll let you dive in and speak a little bit more on the customer engagement. Eric, you are on mute. Um, I also said in my introduction that I am. Um, uh, for me, this was a proposition not to refuse, and 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 very specifically, uh, went over and 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 Marcus Drukstad explained me that technology about two years ago said this can't be true, and after two years it was still true. It was even more true than what I heard first, and and maybe I shall take you to that because it all boils really down to what is in it for the people that use our technology, and there are a couple of benefits that I think are absolutely overwhelming anything that is in the market today. So let me start in this picture. Uh, you see here the three steps in, in recycling. On the left, you start to collect your plastic waste and to sort it and to clean it. Then you do our magical treatment and then you have to post treat it to make sure that somebody can pick it up and do something with it. Now, if we go to the left hand side, the big issue with many of the chemical recycling technologies that you have today, but also with the mechanical recycling technologies, is that they rely on very attractive, nice feedstocks. But remember, we're talking waste here. So the chance that you are going to find that nice feedstock is pretty small. You may find it in some post-production waste. You may find it into, into return bottles, for instance. That is pretty decently described. But most waste is really waste. It is a mixture. Now, unfortunately, as soon as you start to work with mixtures, you end up with mixtures, which is usually the lowest average in terms of properties. And that is where our technology comes in. Because contrary to all the other technologies, we can actually take pretty dirty streams to a point that we even can take residues, which cost you next to nothing, or where you probably even paid to take care of it. And they are extremely important because sometimes the cost of dealing with a residue can make the whole recycling effort prohibitively expensive. So we are able to take all that mixment. And not only does that mean that we can have low input costs, but it also means that we help the world to recover as much of the precious raw material that we throw away altogether every day. To top it off, we do not even need to clean it that much. We are actually happy to take some food residue and some actually help our process to run better. Same for paper. Uh, many of the plastics that we are using to wrap things in are multi-layers. You don't see it, but they are complicated pieces of art, as a matter of fact, that are, with one downside, completely impossible to reprocess by most means. We don't care. If there's ink of it, no problem. If there's glue, we don't even need to dry the feedstock, which is simple treatment, but it costs you a lot of energy if you don't watch out. So there is tremendous benefit to the left-hand side. Then we go into our process and contrary to many other ones, our process is a rather mild one. We can process our plastic waste at temperatures that are such low that we do not lose anything to charring or to uh, gases that have no particular value. You only have to burn them at actually a, a CO2 penalty. 
not such a thing in ours. And also the heat demand of our process is quite low, much lower than the conventional processes for chemical recycling. And that contributes to a lower carbon footprint, which is where the world is looking for. The real miracle comes at the end, because the product that we do make is actually ready to use. It is a clean product that can immediately be processed, for instance, into steam cracking, which is the sort of roundabout for carbon at the beginning of all the chemical value chains, where you build the essential Lego blocks to make all the chemical products as we know them today. Competitive processes like pyrolysis require very costly after treatment to both purify and upgrade to the standards that we got straight out of our process. And those are huge capital items and they are huge OPEX items. And they're also typically steps that come with significant emissions. So if we can avoid all those, that takes out a lot of the cost. And then, yes, we take in some difficult materials and we take in some dirt. And where does it go? Well, it actually goes in a phase, an aqueous phase, a water phase that we separate very easily at the end of the day. And that is then carrying the leftovers of the leftovers of the leftovers. And those six unique benefits make it financially possible to actually process plastic waste and to deal with those streams that others cannot even touch. And when I saw this, I said, okay, to myself, let's see whether it is true. And I can actually only tell you that now that I'm here for almost half a year, it is all true and it is even more true than I thought. Maybe we can go to the next uh, slide over because then the question raises, what are we going to do with it? Well, and we have to realize that if you are in recycling, you are a part of a wheel. And you do have to realize the value with that whole cycle. In the past, we would say in a very old fashioned way, you have to work with a whole value chain. Today, we have to work with a value cycle. And in that cycle are a whole raft of parties and each of them have a huge interest to work with our technology. Let me start at the top right hand corner. There you see the big petrochemical houses. They make those Lego blocks. They are really concerned to have access to renewable feedstock because that is what the market is going to ask from them. And that is not easy. And well, as I told you, we do convert plastic waste. We convert a difficult waste. We do it with high yield. That is precisely what they need. Maximum return of carbon atoms back to their doorstep. And that's what we do. Then there's people who design the articles and they buy the plastic from the pet can people and says, well, I am going to make the packaging. And they have to think of the design of the future because many of the designs today, they are very clever and very advanced and very good to, for instance, preserve food, but they're usually very, very complicated and difficult to recycle. Now, they are very happy to see one technology in the market that actually deals with these complex designs because it allows them to continue supplying a very high level of packaging and protection while still making sure that it all can be pulled back. And we work with those because they want to know whether all their clever tricks can actually go through our process. The third one are the retailers. These are the big brands, the fast moving consumer good companies, the durable good manufacturers, the people that make cars, all under expensive brands. And they represent tremendous value. And whereas the world is still discussing a lot about circularity and how to make it, one thing seems to be sure. These people here, these brand owners, as we call them, they are going to pay the bills. They will have to pay to make sure that every piece of packaging that they put into the market is going to be recyclable. And this is no small beer. I give you an example from Europe, from my own country, where every fast moving consumer goods company has to pay a thousand euros for every ton of plastic they send into the market. And those thousand euros are used to collect the stuff and to send it to the best possible destination. And by creating a better possible destination, we are going to save cost for that whole value chain. At the bottom, we are the consumers, you and I at home. 
And of course, we all want to do good for the world. And it's a bit difficult. We also don't want to pay too much. We are represented by our governments, by our NGOs and the consumer organizations, and they put demands. We are talking with them and they like what they see. They want to see powerful techniques to make sure that we can on one hand enjoy the performance that we are used to from our packaging and whatever else. The other hand, to have it responsibly in a circular fashion and also for an affordable cost. And that is why our technology is so good. Next one, we are now at quarter to any hour. Waste management companies, they are getting all that waste in and they have to make sure that they split it in such a way that not only it is properly separated and taken care of, but also that it is done in, at the lowest possible cost and that they can make a decent living of it at the same time that we can pay it. Well, as I already said, whereas some of the purer fractions of our waste can be happily recycled and create value, it is really in the, the, in the residue that the devil is. Because that is where you have the impossible streams, where you find a lot of moist uh, paper and dirty food residues and where you have wastewater. It is in that residue that actually the clue is to make that whole cycle work and spin. Eric? So uh, these people are very interested. May I, may I ask, can you hear me, Eric? Yes, certainly. Would you, would you tell the audience uh, on our customer engagement who we have on, on this circle? Perhaps uh... I will say where they are from, where they sit. Where yes. They are. Yeah, yeah. So that comes on the next page. But um, and the last one, and that is actually a category that still is is shaping up, is the people that will actually build these chemical recycling factories. Typically, these factories are actually a little bit too small for the giant pet camps, whereas the waste companies do not really want to touch it. So a new class of chemical operators is going to spring up. And we will be the ones that supply them with the technologies. Now, it is a long dose cycle where we are finding our partners. And our partners will have a variety of purposes. At this moment, we see a lot of support from these monomer and plastic players. That is where we have at least three of our customer engagements today because they are used to the whole idea of playing chemistry. At the same time, for them, it is probably the closest. They are the ones that need to secure that. We are also working now with a plastic converter who really wants to know whether what he is doing is the right thing to do. We are talking with a consumer goods company who often sit on manufacturing waste, and we have one of those in our state as well. We are talking to governments to tell that we are doing the right thing on behalf of the voters, i.e. the consumers uh, that we are seeing there. We are also starting to talk to the waste management companies. And we have no specific engagement there yet, uh, but we expect to have them soon. And maybe we can then see what is going to happen. If you click one more over, you will see that uh, what is going to happen now. In summary, we see a very high interest along this value cycle. And as I said, we have at least five active engagements, but we have more than 20 active customer engagement dossiers. Customers that have expressed their interest and they are on every possible corner of the circle. That sounds very strange because circles don't have corners, uh, but each of those, uh, what is it, uh, seven uh, come with people that want to talk to us because we do address the issues that the market is seeing today. Coming back to what Alfred just said, we shall build this also up. So these customer engagement, these people start with an evaluation, and that is also the stage where they do not want us to disclose their names. I must say we have not failed a single evaluation. But what we have to do in this year is to sort of channel those different evaluations into the three tracks that have been so well explained by Alfred. We will start, of course, with a simple one, quote unquote, where we do not make our life too difficult. That is the button, the orange one, where we work with reasonably clean production waste and where we will just deconstruct it. And then you will also have your separation of your product at the end will be a little bit simpler. So but Eric, just to, give, uh, just to give just to give an example to the folks there that are listening, imagine 
a, a very single type of polymer that is just is is is, is coming out of a plant before it goes out to, yeah. to the waste stream. Uh, basically, it's clean, it's pure, it doesn't need a lot of complexity, and we have enough capability to build a small system around it, basically. Yeah. Right? Yep. If you go to the next level, you're still talking about something clean, but where already the, 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 it has separate elements. And think of a multi-layer film. Uh, you typically have them some polyethylene for those that are skilled in the art. That is the waterproofer almost. That is the moisture barrier. But typically you want to have another barrier for odors of cheese or fish or whatever else. And you also have want to have a gas barrier to make sure that the oxygen doesn't go in and, and cause rancidity. Three materials, valuable each. And very often you have production waste, eh, the cutoffs from the films. And yeah, the product is, because of its complexity, actually very difficult to process, even though it is actually rather clean. Now, for us, that is the ideal step two. Uh, here we will actually make two or three uh, products at the end of the day, where sometimes even what we call residue is the main product for the customer. Uh, but we will do it. The top level is where the difficulty is. That is the mixed waste. That is the residue. That is often very unpredictable. It varies per season, it varies per town, it varies per day. That is where you need a very robust technology. This is also, of course, where the mainstream is. And this is the residue from our daily waste. That is complicated. There will be a lot of unpredictable situations. We will take that last. But that is not a distant future at all. We will expect, we already have, we are working on an engagement with a leading customer to go from, let's say, the blue hexagon into the blue triangle within the very uh, next half year. And then obviously we'll have to bring that to an end where we will have a little bit more of a challenge with the waste of the waste. So the journey, folks, uh, of commercialization involve actions that are supposed to de-risk the, the, the journey and generate some revenue and on the way be very close and keep very close ties with organization that are interested in our product. And so, of course, uh, the shell of the world are uh, represent a more complex material. That is the blue, I'll say. But they are already on the technology evaluation for that perspective. And as we move forward uh, and turn some of those uh, partners that we, you know, some they're confidential, sorry, but, but we haven't announced on their names. But our goal is then to turn them into a collaborators. And you guys uh, are able to see and judge that, okay, now Duro has one or two of technology evaluators. Now they're turning into collaboration. And now as we move forward, uh, you can see where, where the commercialization. So it gives the tools basically for you to anticipate where we are and you know judge basically on our success on one hand on the other hand it gives us a, a very close uh, tool for us to engage with them in order to better design engineer patent all the things that are very very important uh, for us in order to to move that that journey again with the concept of adding value and not uh, uh, and de-risking the process basically de-risking the, de the journey anything else to add to this uh, area yeah I, I thank forward? you over for that yeah, because uh, for you investors it's also important to realize a startup is a startup and we are like a 20 people company we do not have the engineering might that the big uh, thing is and, like a big one yeah so by aligning with others we will also mobilize their capabilities. At the same time, we will be in tune with our markets and learn what is required. We are also going to be in tune with our suppliers and the other parties in the whole thing. And I'll give you one example. If you look at waste management, it's only a year ago that certain waste management streams became available. But that technology is not standing still either. And as we speak, advanced separation technologies are introduced, which will extract even more easy material from the mainstream. Now, that is wonderful because there will be more material that we can mechanically recycle. But it also means that the residue stream is going to be even worse. 
and the challenge to people like ourselves even larger. Now, whether you like it or not, that's what's happening. And it is better to stay tuned and be prepared for what is coming. And also for that crucial stay in touch function, it is so crucial to go through these customer engagements and make sure that we are truly preparing for the technology of tomorrow rather than the technology of yesterday. And maybe I shall leave my contribution there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'll move, uh, folks. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us. This is uh, basically the last slide we want to show before we're moving on to the Q&A. Uh, a, a little bit of an outlook uh, for the 2024. You, you've seen and we hope we showed you why uh, the work on the customer engagement is so important for us uh, and, and uh, basically a tool for you to, to look uh, of, to judge of our progress. Through that journey, we are working to basically design the next level reactor, protect our patent and move on from a simple uh, reactor to some kind of a configured reactor to some kind of a reactor system. Basically, that, that's our journey. And as we do that, it's better to do that with with uh, customers, basically, and, and some money. And so the strategic outlook for us for 2024 is basically converting existing customers uh, from technology evaluators to technology collaborators where you will be able to see that they are joining in in the in the work in the journey and now it's you know that customer was already a, an evaluator now is a collaborator and going forward as we'll move that uh, that um, items or stages you can see that the customer is staying with us which in return de-risks the company uh, we will, of course, in parallel, continue to work on the design and build of the Tonpe Day reactor because uh, we never know when a customer is coming in, but when he's coming in, we want to be ready and show him what we have independently and develop our independent process on our reactor. And that is the commitment we uh, also gave to our investors. And through that journey, of course, we are continue to and actively to uh, uh, work on our, our IP. This is a very dense art. Uh, the company was always proactive, uh, looking forward and ahead uh, to the areas that we want to go in. And we feel we need to do that as well as we are moving forward to the 2024. So basically, those are our strategic outlook. Each one of them will add value to the company. So Aduro is very much prepared in terms of the building blocks where we build our units, we increase our team, we have to increase it a little bit more, I guess. Um, uh, we have our, our um, office ready. We've done all of this and, and now we are increasing our work to engage with customers, to focus on the things that continue and add value uh, to the company through the journey of commercialization. With that, I'll say thank you very much for listening to me. That's the end of my part. Maybe we'll go to the Q&A unless uh, uh, Eric or Mina wants to add anything else. I'll pass it to, to uh, Abe. And I remind you, Abe, that there is also the short video that we've been doing um and it, you know the guys listening to here will be able to see it for the first time very good um okay so with that i've uh you know there have been a lot of inquiries uh, coming in there are over 150 of you that uh, registered for the event and uh, uh many of you have submitted questions so we've aggregated some of those questions uh with the remaining time I'll uh, walk through some of those and, and uh, pose them to uh, our panel. Um, the first question is, uh, maybe this one's for you, Eric. <clears throat> Can you provide insight into the technical validation of uh, Duro's technology and its advantages over competitors? Yeah, thank you, Abe, for the question, and also thank you in the audience for bringing it up. Uh, what I have tried on the, on the slide with the six boxes or the nine boxes is to highlight what the advantages are. And these are real, tangible, monetary advantages. What we have done is we have looked at all the components that you do find in waste. And actually, there is one question also that talks about the different classes of plastics. We have taken all major plastics and we have actually followed how they travel through our system from top left to bottom right. We have done that on the laboratory scale because then you can follow it precisely. Because I already said, once you are looking at random waste, 
you are seeing the whole mess and then you have to difficultly sort out other results. But for all the major individual plastics and also a number of the additional contaminants, we follow that track and that is what I call validation. And the next step will be to take that validated chemistry and turn it into a useful process. So maybe I'll just follow up with that uh, question that you're referring to, which is, can you elaborate on which of the seven classes of plastics can be processed and what are the yields of each class? Maybe that's asking too much, but I think uh, maybe on the uh, different types of plastics, uh, you've got some thoughts. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'll take the opportunity to also say a little bit about the order of magnitude. Yeah? If you look what we put in our plastic uh, waste streams eh? and in, in Canada it is a blue box and in my country it's a yellow bag and I'm sure there's other things as well. Uh, roughly two-thirds to three-quarters of that is what we call polyolefin. It is polyethylene or it is polypropylene and that is the bulk of all the plastic foils and films uh, of the milk jugs and whatever else. Um, for the polyethylene, we even have two classes, high density and low density. And all of that, two thirds to three quarters, sails through our system and will be gratefully converted into the right product that we want. And then I think we have uh, two categories of plastics already covered. A third material that goes through there is polystyrene. You, you find that it's a little bit more of a, of a hard plastic. You find it in yogurt cups. And that's an, a typical uh, use. Also, polystyrene is without any problem converted in our system. Then we have PET. That's the bottles. Um, our system is not really designed for PET, but that's not a real problem because PET tends to be used in its pure form. And it is very easily recovered. It is also very easily separated. And a typical waste stream where you have taken out the bottles under a return money system or something like that, as we have them in Europe, it will contain maybe only 3% max of PET. Now, what is the brilliant thing in our process? The PET will go in. It will be converted. It will not end up in the oil. And that is actually a great thing because if that ends up in our product oil, it will contaminate it. And that is precisely what happens in so many other things. For us, it will sail through our system. It will actually be reacted to some harmless building blocks and it will leave the system in our side stream. But mind you, it is only a couple of percent. We have PVC and that is a bit of a similar case. PVC is by the way, a material that you find increasingly little in packaging and in household streams. It is really par excellence, the material that is used in construction because of its longevity. If it comes in, it will react, it will be converted to innocent things. It will not contaminate our product streams as it is in other processes. And that is how it will sail through our system. The last stream is what people describe as mixed everything. And also there, we can say that all of that material can be handled in our system. There is actually not a single plastic that we cannot take in. It will sail through our system. It will not contaminate our clean oil. It will leave the system through our residue stream. And then you're talking really about the residue of the residue, which is not going to be much more than five to 10% of the total stuff that you started with. And even if that were pure enough, you might even try to recover some of the elements from the residue stream. But that depends a little bit how pure it is. For cl All right. So Eric, for clarification, I just want to tell the audience that basically our technology works well with polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, where the rest of the families, we consider them as contaminating mode. And in the contaminating mode, the one we don't anticipate for them to be more than two, three percent, which in result does not affect our process, basically. Uh, it's two things. It is not more than two to three percent to begin with. Yeah. And then if it is in our system, it is actually channeled nicely to the back door. Okay. It is going to the residue. It is not compromising the quality of our product. And I think that is a unique strength. So we deal with it. 
Yeah, without, uh, whereas other processes do not. It ends up in the oil and you really have to spend a lot of money and effort to treat it there and to yeah. post-treat your product. We don't need that. So it is, yeah, send it in. We don't care. Yeah, we will deal with it. It's not going to make us more oil, but it will certainly uh, not bother us either. Okay. All right. So maybe we can get... Um... Uh, maybe Mina, one for you, since uh, you've been quiet this whole time. Um, it is behaving. Yes, yeah, right. Um, Mina, people with excellent backgrounds uh, have recently joined the board and uh, management. Are further potential board and management personnel currently targeted? Thanks, Abe. Um, so basically, in the last six months, we've been very successful in attracting top global talent. One example, of course, is Eric Appleman, not to put him on the spot here, who recently joined us as Chief Revenue Officer. And of course, we've recently been joined by Marie Grunberg uh, as board member. And I want to say that in a very short period of time that they've both added tremendous value to Aduro and its shareholders. They've had a major impact on the management team and pushing us uh, to the next step, of course. Now, as we continue to progress and demonstrate our value proposition, I have no doubt that we will continue to attract very, very strong talent to our management team and as well to our board. Now, our goal as a management team is to have the most capable team possible for any specific stage at hand, and that will continue to evolve as we continue to execute and grow the company. Um, so I, I want to say, for example, that, you know, Eric's been on the road recently in Europe presenting the company. And I want to say everybody that hears the story and hears about us, you know, coming out the door and what we're working on and the progress we've made to date. There's not a single person in the room that is not tremendously impressed and is watching us with a very, very, you know, close eye on, on how we progress over the next few months, um, you know, moving forward. All right, maybe one for Ofer then. Um, at what point will you be able to announce the names of companies that you are piloting with? And maybe that's for Ofer and Eric. Uh, when, when they, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, reasonably to say, uh, once we have crossed the technology evaluation and come go back to the collaboration, that then there'll be probably announcements. So. Uh, um, we need to remember and respect the fact that this major uh, petrochemical organization uh, has to make uh, millions and millions of dollars of decisions going forward uh, into the future. They're testing uh, different uh, technologies. We have the great opportunity to show them our case and to showcase uh, the, the hydrochemolytic technology. And at some point of time, and they are well aware of our journey, they know it. And once, you know, Shell has done it uh, uh, kindly in the beginning, once we won. And I'm sure as we, our relationship will will progress, that will uh, allow us to provide their names. And if I may add something, sorry, Abe, to cut you off there, but uh, ultimately uh, there's a, a strategy involved in some of these relationships, right? Some of our customers do not want to show their hands in terms of who they're working with. So it might not only be the fact that they want to get a little bit closer to us before they start putting their name out there, but they might want to still keep their strategy tight uh, under covers uh, because they're you know, working on major, major projects and they don't really want to show their hand to the community as a whole. So of course, when we're able to announce, we will 100% be doing so, but we need to focus on the confidentiality agreements that we have at hand and only do so with the blessings of these customers, of course. Okay, so maybe another one for uh, for Ofer then. Um, given that the R2 has been running for several months now, what is the current timeline and estimate for R3? Yeah, that's uh, thank you for the question. So uh, the R2, uh, the goal of the R2 was to commit it into two really basic uh, items. The first one, of course, and the major one is to produce sufficient data for us to design the R3. And the second one is to showcase uh, uh, the continuous flow process to our uh, potential partners that are doing technology evaluation. Uh, we are on our way uh, from data that we have generated so far to make some decisions with concerns of the R3. In general, we want to be by the end of the year with not just the design, but start buying uh, equipment. And so we feel uh, closer to the end of the year, um, either at early 
uh, 2025 that uh, the R2 will be up and running. We're taking our time to validate, cross-validate, and uh, make sure that uh, the design that we will choose, the work that we will do, um, will be the one that uh, you know will be so that our reactor will be the one uh, that has the most significant impact on our economical and commercial journey. If if I may say something on that front, of course we've been we've been really focused on obtaining the data that we need for the next scale up. Of course, through the R twos that we've built. So the the main contingent there was to get the R twos up and running, maximize the time that we extract the data that we need for the next scale up. Uh, there is also you know ordering the key components that might take a little bit longer to land on site, but we are really focused on the R three uh, in 2024. Uh, the whole team is has that as a as a main goal. Uh, so we are intending on starting the process as soon as we possibly can, but we can't really start it too soon without the data that we need to make the right decisions, right? So we want to avoid having to have a start and coming back, uh, pivoting a little bit, but we want to make major, major progress on the R3 scale up in 2024. Uh, you know, whether it's completed by end of year or, you know, early to mid the following year, that is a question of, of many, many factors. Uh, but by the end of next year, we'd like to make significant, significant process uh, progress on that front. But, but Mina, also fair to say that to, to you know, to um, maybe add to this is that the fact that we are working and intend to work with majors to help us, uh, um, you know, continue the, the journey, that adds um, a, a de-risking factor because from their perspective, they may want to customize something. So, so there is a bit of a dynamic and flow of relationship between what we're doing. Regardless, we are independently moving on and you know building our own uh, system, Tompe Day system, so we could uh, uh, make sure that we have you know all all questions answers. Absolutely, and I think that's a great point, Ofer. That wasn't uh, you know in a question that we've received. But the fact that we may or may be collaborating with several large entities and building something like an R3 like does not uh, deviate us from our current plans of scaling up the technology, uh, you know, as, as a duro, right? So we might be working on several projects. We might be making significant progress on our own R3 and maybe starting on another one. Uh, so that will all be dictated, of course, with the collaborations, but it's not a, a singular path. We are quite uh, focused on having many, many options as we continue to uh, mature as a company. So maybe just uh, to expand on on uh, some of those collaborations and uh, where the current <laughs> collaborations that we have are taking us. So this question's uh, for you, Ofer. What is the status of the Shell Game Changer program? What happens with Shell when that Game Changer program ends? Right. Um, so uh, we have a confidential agreement with Shell. We we have to respect that, and we cannot say anything uh, about it. Uh, we have uh, passed the 50% mark uh, several months ago already, and we announced it out of the six phases. We have just submitted uh, stage four of six stages, and we are on the march to conduct, uh, of course, to work on stage five and six, which are the final stages. Uh, in the next coming weeks, we will uh, discuss, maybe month, we'll discuss with Shell uh, the going forward and only later we'll be able to announce it. But we have to respect the fact that we're talking to a very, very large partner, second largest company in the world. Uh, I mentioned again and again that uh, we, you know, we respect Shell, but we also bring other players to the market to work somewhat in the same fashion in order to balance and de-risking the whole process. So we love Shell very much, and but we want to see more partners or brands that are working with us, uh, not maybe on a year time. Most of the customer engagement uh, that we have right now are maybe anywhere between three to six months, but it is uh, something that we are working to balance the whole idea. So uh, the whole concept of it. Okay. Um, here's another question for you all for around um, our two scale up and commercialization path. So. Okay. Uh, what are the key milestones of, uh, Aduro aims to achieve in the next year regarding product development and commercialization? We've kind of talked about that, but in another opportunity to reiterate that. Yeah, so so maybe to recap that, and that that will be, I guess, the end of my part, and we'll give it to to 
Um, uh, what we want to do is to achieve, uh, to move uh, the list of not all of them, but some of the technology evaluators that are paying now, the paying contract into a collaborator mode. This is our most strategic item that we want to see. This is good for the investors because we do risk in the company, but also good for the company because they're working with a customer. We do so add service. The other strategic goals, as you can see on the screen, is you know of course uh, continue the design and complete the design for the R three and bring it into some kind of a completion, so we could build it uh, very soon and of course expand on the IP. So the journey basically for the investors, the message is for investors that we are 100% focused on adding value to the company. Out of the three items, each one of them is significant for the company. Either we have a complete design and machine or tone per day that we can showcase, or we have more customers that are working with us and we increase our revenue and we have an uh, organization that can help us to collaborate and bring some engineering or other resources, or we expanded our patent fencing and we have much more to protect and recall. So every item of this, uh, brings an add value to the company, and those are the three uh, strategic um, items that we are considering for 2024. All right, maybe I'll ask uh, this one to you, or direct this one to you, Eric. Um, to date, has management become aware of anything threatening the commercialization of Aduro's uh, technology in by way of uh, threatening the patents or the know-how um, of technology scale-up? And I ask you that just from your Brightlands um, experience and what you've seen with other companies. Yeah, I think the fact that I am here today on this screen is is telling the story, and and maybe I can give you some numbers. Um, most routes to recycle plastics in a chemical way are based on seventy-year-old refining technology, the crude methods that were used in the early days to squeeze more gasoline out of crude oil. And if you were to say to me today, OK, there are 71 companies out there who are trying to do that. 70 of them use that old fashioned technology and there's only one that uses the technology that Aduro has not only invented, but also protected and progressed significantly. Uh, this is very much our land and, and, and many others do variations on one and technology that in, in endless variations, um, I have not seen anything that comes even close to what we are doing. And to top that one off, we are continuously investing to protect that because this is not just one technology, this is a platform. There are many things that we can do with it and by weaving a dense mechanism of defense around that in the form of intellectual property barriers, which is patents, but it is also know-how and it is also just being years ahead of anybody else and that will pretty much leave this to us. Great. Uh, Mina, this one I think is uh, probably for you. Um, it do you plan to list Aduro's common shares on the TSX or Venture Exchange or other exchange? And if not, why not? Maybe you share some of uh, our yeah, strategies. Yeah, I mean, tell there. us why not. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we have we've talked about this in the past, and we've always mentioned that our medium term goal is to uplist to a major exchange in North America. Now, of course, that is you know uh, a Canadian main board like the TSX, or or it could be a US uh, main board, uh, the NASDAQ possibly. Uh, so the timing, of course, depends on multiple factors, including market conditions. So we need to choose the best time to go down that road. Uh, if we target the TSX main board, then a logical stepping stone would be the TSX venture, right? It would be the, the perfect uh, middle in between where we are today and the TSX main board. There's a lot of advantages, of course, going through that process. On the other hand, we can target a listing on a major US exchange directly. What I can say today, though, is that we're closely monitoring all the key factors relevant to making this decision, right? So we are hyper focused on efficiency and timing. Uh, whatever decision we make in the following you know, months, year, uh, but timing is critical on any of these uh, decisions. But we're very prepared. We're building the framework behind it all to allow us to do so. 
Um, but depending on the pathway, things will have to some decisions will have to be made. Uh, but that's that's as much as we can say right now. Uh, we've recently upgraded to the OTC QX from the OTC QV. That was a strategic decision we made uh, to get a better footprint in the US. It comes with higher liquidity. Uh, it does allow more funds and high net worth individuals to invest in our stock a little bit more easily than the QB. Uh, so we made that decision, of course, a couple of months ago, uh, and I think we've seen some benefits of that on the US side. Uh, but that's kind of the answer for, for now. Mina, right. fair to say that uh, we, we're considered, this is not a sleeping uh, item, right? We, we as a team are considering our progress, are considering the work that we've been doing are considering mm -hmm. the market situation and and you know we we're, we're digesting it in in the thinking process and strategizing what is best to do for our shareholders and for the company basically uh, uh, absolutely that that is the plan it remains the plan i think we've we've confirmed that several times in the past year uh but we can't make that decision in isolation for us to get the payback to our shareholders and the benefit to the company uh it has to be timed perfectly uh, but in the meantime, we are creating the processes and framework behind it all to allow us to make that decision quite swiftly, right? So we're not making the call, you know, six months from now and having to build the whole infrastructure to support it, right? So we're keeping a very close eye is what I can say at this point. Yeah, that's, uh, we want our investors to know that we are working uh, on those fronts and, and considering, uh, you know, as we're moving forward. And that is all our questions that uh, we're going to be able to take today. Um, we are going to play in a, our new video that uh, identifies the uh, HPU process and walks through that process with you. Um, if uh, do any of you want to have a final um, uh, closing comment or discussion, um, if not, then I'll close it with uh, comments around um, the holidays and wishing everybody a um, great holiday season. Abe, uh, so just to say thank you for our audience for listening and taking the time for thinking about us. Of course, to my end and for the team, happy holiday. I do want to say something about the team that has been working day and night. Either it's on the operation, on the research, it's it's on the management uh, uh, to uh, bring the company and to change the company uh, again from uh, early 2023 to the end of 2023. We are looking forward for 2024 and I hope we pass the message for the investors how important uh, those items, those building blocks that we build uh, and infrastructure that we build makes us ready to move forward. With that, I'll say happy holiday and I'll let you complete the webinar. Sorry. OK, with that, uh, we'll put a close for today and uh, stay tuned. Next is the uh, HPU process uh, video. Happy holidays, everyone. In the 20th century, plastic emerged as a revolutionary solution to many challenges facing our world. A versatile commodity born of innovation, plastic quickly became an integral part of modern life. Yet, the widespread use of plastic has brought unintended consequences. Globally, only 10% of plastic waste is recycled, with resins like polystyrene, polypropylene, and polyethylene posing particular challenges. Derived from fossil fuels, the solution now is also a complex problem. Introducing Aduro Clean Technologies, where innovation meets inspiration. Our revolutionary hydrochemolytic technology applies game-changing chemistry to sustainably transform difficult-to-recycle plastics into valuable materials efficiently and cost-effectively. Plastic waste is shredded and fed into the configured process system where it begins the hydrochemolytic journey that converts the solid plastics into liquid hydrocarbons. The molecular deconstruction occurs through the application of heat in combination with water and other safe process additives. But reactivities of the various resins in the prepared plastic feedstock are different due to their differing chemical properties. We deal with this by progressively increasing the process intensity. Initially, lower temperatures are applied for resins that undergo conversion most easily, like polystyrene, 
and then the small molecular fragments generated are removed. The more resistant resins that remain, like polypropylene and polyethylene, continue through the reactor system where temperatures now are tuned to also convert them, yielding saturated hydrocarbon liquids. Besides the various resins, plastic waste can be wet, but typically it also contains other materials such as nylon, paper from cups, and metals like aluminum foil. As our hydrochemolytic technology is water-based and can handle higher levels of such contaminants, we can process plastics that are difficult to recycle by other approaches. In fact, in the process, our technology can effectively turn cellulose in burger wraps and coffee cups into a chemical agent used in the process. This approach is unique and has four significant benefits. First, it acts like a filter that removes low levels of other resins that can be problematic for other approaches. Second, it applies to all three polyethylene, polypropylene and polystyrene, which, according to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, represent over 70% of municipalities' plastic waste. Third, yields of useful liquids recovered from those plastics are very high. And finally, it is modular too. Our hydrochemolytic technology can be customized to fit specific needs, from small, remote locations to large facilities in chemical plants or cities. This flexibility results in cost savings and efficiency. By overcoming the limitations of traditional recycling methods, difficult to recycle plastics no longer are destined for landfills, incineration or dumping, but instead are transformed into a 21st century resource. At Aduro, we are dedicated to meeting environmental challenges and shaping a circular economy. Join us on this inspiring journey to a cleaner, more sustainable future.